Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company taking a look at one of the rifles that is going to be in their upcoming April of 2020 Premier Auction. This is a Brown and Schott, or Brown and Van Schott, uh, single shot rifle. It was manufactured to be entered in US military trials in, I believe, 1872. Uh, these trials were substantial, they were huge. They had over a hundred rifles, or ninety-eight rifles, in the trial. So US Ordnance Department was pretty much just deluged with ideas from inventors who had uh, concepts for new breech-loading rifles, and Van Schoet is no exception. Now uh, it's called Brown and Van Schoet because the actual design and the patents uh, were taken out by a guy named Sylvanus Frederick Van Schoet of Massachusetts, and then he got the Brown Manufacturing Company to actually build his trials rifles. Um, this is a fairly common relationship that you'll see in the firearms industry back then, and frankly still today. One guy, come, one guy has the idea, the other guy has the money and or the manufacturing. So uh, this didn't do so well. It has a number of unique ideas to it, and the two patents behind it are interesting, so let's take a look at those. All right, we'll talk about the double trigger in just a moment, but let's start by taking a look at the markings. There's only one set of markings on here, and that is on the bolt, and on this example they're kind of double stamped. Uh, this says Brown Manufacturing, Newburyport, Massachusetts, and then it has two patent dates, May 11, 1869 and August 24th, 1869. And those are helpful because we can look up Sylvanus Frederick von Schott's patents from those two specific days and see what exactly he was trying to get at here. The only other marking on the gun is a serial number. This is 36, and it's uh, here, and it's also on two other spots on the bolt, which you'll see in a minute. Let me go ahead and take the bolt out first and show you how this works, and then we'll come back and actually look at the controls and the operation. So this screw is what prevents the bolt from coming out the back of the receiver, because when you open the bolt it's going to hit that screw. This is not unlike the Mauser 1871. So if I pull that out now, the bolt just pops out the back of the rifle. All right, here is our bolt. It has a single locking lug on the rear surface right there when you turn the bolt handle. That lug locks into the rear of the receiver. Uh, this was chambered for a, I believe, a proprietary 4570 cartridge, but it was black powder. A single locking lug is sufficient, sufficiently strong for that. Now there's a concern I have up at the front. If we, well, a reading of Van Schoet's first patent, the May patent, uh, a lot of what he's talking about is simplification and doing away with unnecessary parts in a bolt action rifle design. And he did a pretty good job of that. Like, this is a pretty darn simple system he's put together. However, sometimes that sort of simplicity comes with a price. If you look at the extractor here, you'll see that it is a solid piece integral to the front of the bolt. There's no extractor spring which means you cannot drop a cartridge into the rifle and then just push the bolt home. What you have to do when you're loading it is, if I bring this in as a surrogate cartridge, you have to hook the lip of the, the rim of the cartridge under that extractor when you load the cartridge, or else you're going to slam it into the breech uh, face and it's, it's not going to chamber. The bolt won't go all the way forward because this will not pop up over the rim of a cartridge. So on the one hand, this is very durable. You're not going to have extractor failures, like, ever with this system. On the other hand, you are going to have failures to feed, because guys are inevitably either through not knowing how to run the bolt, uh, or simply stress uh, under time pressure, they're going to mess up the loading process and not get the rim under that extractor. By the way, while we're right here, there are the other two serial numbers on the bolt. Now the other really interesting aspect to this particular rifle is this slot in it. And this is a rifle that actually does not have a striker, it has an internal hammer. So this is the locked position, and you can see the firing pin, the back of the firing pin right there. Uh, unfortunately I believe this firing pin is broken off inside there, because it's it doesn't protrude out the front, or at least I can't get it to. At any rate, when the bolt handle's down, this internal piece allows access to the firing pin. When the bolt handle is up, it's blocked. So that's your out of battery safety to ensure that the rifle doesn't fire when it's unlocked. And then the hammer is right back here, 
in the bottom of the action. So that's why we have two triggers. The rear trigger is for cocking the action, this cocks the hammer, and the front trigger fires. So if I pull the back trigger, you can see it'll pull the hammer slightly back more, like that. Uh, the patent actually describes a way to decock the gun by holding the rear trigger, pulling the front trigger, and then gently releasing the rear one. So I should, in theory, be able to do that. There we go. So I have now manually decocked the rifle. That is, by the way, a horrific safety violation by today's uh, standards, if you use that as a way to make the rifle safe while it's loaded. And it's interesting to me that in the patent, Van Schoet specifically identifies that as a thing. Like, you might want to leave the rifle loaded and uncocked, and here's how you can do it. Hold the rear hammer, pull the front, or hold the rear trigger, pull the front one, and gently lower the hammer onto the firing pin. Anyway, uh, so to fire this thing, you would first pull the rear trigger, which cocks the hammer, and then you can pull the front trigger to fire it. Now the handy thing is, this also works as an automatic cock on open system, because when the bolt opens it's going to push the hammer back and re-cock it automatically, as I will demonstrate for you now. So I'm going to decock this like so. So the rifle has now been fired, I can open the bolt, pull it back, and it's got, there's a little bit of resistance there when it's recocking the hammer, but once that's done I can then drop my cartridge in, or rather I can't, I can lower my cartridge in, lever it under the extractor, and then close the bolt, rifle's cocked and ready to fire again. Now there's also a screw slot on the very back of the bolt, and this is pretty well seized up. Like I tried giving it a little, a little turn and it doesn't want to move, and I'm not going to force it. Um, however, I believe this is based on Van Schoet's second patent, which is, I think, pretty funny. Uh, it is a patent to allow you to adjust the tension in the bolt handle, so that you can make the bolt easier or harder to actually lift and close uh, by turning a screw on the back of the bolt, which turns a cam, and adjusts the tension on the bolt handle. That is, I, I think that's something that reflects very well on some aspects of today's firearm in industry, where you will find people who are innovating solutions to problems that really don't exist. This is the classic example of an answer to a question that nobody ever asked. Like, I wish the bolt handle could be slightly less or slightly more difficult to open, said nobody ever. Before I let you go, I want to give you just a quick little history on the Brown Manufacturing Company that made the rifle. Uh, it actually started out as the Ball and Williams Company of Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, they manufactured Ballard rifles, and then Williams retired in 1865. The company was subsequently bought out by Merwin and Bray in 1866. They moved it from Worcester to Newburyport. Uh, they continued to make Ballards, and they also started making Derringers. The company was then purchased by John Hamilton Brown in 1869. That's where Brown Manufacturing comes from. Uh, he made, uh, well, he made these rifles. He also made a Brown Merrill trials rifle, which was a little bit better, but also unsuccessful in the 1872 trials. And ultimately, he would sell the manufacturing company in 1873 uh, to John Marlin, uh, after which point it became part of what is today the Marlin uh, Firearms Company which I think has been bought up by someone else since, but uh, that's your brief history of Brown manufacturing. I think this rifle is a perfect embodiment of the idea that just because something's special or different doesn't mean that it's better, and innovation for the sake of innovation doesn't necessarily make sense. Like, we like to encourage innovation, and it's a, it's a good starting point, but innovating a system that's actually worse than the existing systems, or innovating a system that has substantial serious flaws to it, well, you, you don't end up winning with something like that. And Van Schoet didn't win. Uh, this rifle went nowhere in the trials. Uh, it was one of many, many guns that were submitted that were deemed inferior or undesirable. Uh, as a result, it's a tremendously rare rifle today. There are only a handful of them that were made in the first place. You saw the serial number on this, a couple dozen maybe at most. Uh, and a handful, single digit numbers of them survive today. So for the people, for the folks who are interested in US military developmental firearms, this is a fantastic example, one of very few that you'll ever run into. 
Um, if you're interested, if that sounds like you, this rifle is of course in the Rock Island April auction. You can check out their pictures and their description uh, at their website. You can also check out everything else that's in the catalogue. Thanks for watching.